every year in North America, eight million people contemplate this. One million people attempt it. 39,000 succeed. Succeed at what? Suicide. 39,000, that's twice the rate of homicide. As a matter of fact, annually, more people die from self-harm than homicide, natural disasters, and war combined. And practically no one is talking about it until now. Uh, if you're looking for an idea worth spreading, all you need is a tribe and a vacuum. Seth Godin, The Tribes We Lead, TED 2009. My tribe uh, is people who suffer from depression and for whom the option of suicide is always on the menu. And the vacuum is, again, that practically no one is talking about it. Which fascinates me, and I'll tell you why. Because I've discovered over my lifetime that just the mere mention of the words depression and suicide out loud elicit the most amazing revelations from people, some of whom I have just met. It's almost as if they are waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to give them permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences surrounding depression and suicide. It's almost as if it's like a fractured fairy tale. It's almost as if they're waiting for somebody to come up and utter the magic, or in this case, the tragic words, depression and suicide. Last month, I was working a ship, a uh, cruise. I do a number of cruises, and I was in the Lido Buffet. Every ship has a Lido, by the way. And I couldn't find a place to sit. And I see a woman at a table for two, and I said, excuse me, do you mind if I sit? She goes, no, sit, sit, sit. So I sit down, she looks up, she goes, hey, are you the comedian? I go, hey, did you enjoy the comedy show? She goes, I did. I go, well, I'm the comedian. She goes, well, what would you have said if I said I didn't enjoy the comedy show? I'm the juggler. <laughs> we got to chatting. She said, is cruise ships, all, are cruise ships all you do? I said, no, I do quite a bit of motivational speaking. And you know what? I just nailed down a TED Talk. She goes, uh, what's the topic? And I'm thinking to myself, here we go. I said, depression and suicide. And then I started to count down in my head. Three, two, one. She says, you know what? I tried to kill myself twice. She and I have just met. She goes, first time, kind of half-hearted. It was in college, not particularly serious. She said, the second time, far more serious. She goes, I not only graduated college, I had graduated medical school. I was a doctor. I had the knowledge. I had the equipment. I had an IV started in my ankle. I had the suicide cocktail in my left hand, the two vials. In my right hand, I had the syringe, getting ready to load it up. And she says, the phone rings. Oh. And I'm thinking to myself, do I answer it? Well, she said, you know, I was afraid it was somebody who would worry. They would come over, they would interrupt. So I picked up the phone. She goes, turns out it's my 13 and a half year old son. And she said, you know, I don't know if he heard something in the way I said hello, or he had a premonition, but the first thing he said to me was, mom, don't do anything. She said, I didn't. I didn't give up on the idea of suicide, but I decided not to do it that day because I was afraid, she said, he would realize that it had happened right after we spoke and he would feel guilty, that maybe he could have said something that would have stopped me from committing suicide. So I said to her, well, how old is he now? She goes, he's 21. I said, does he know that he stopped your suicide? She goes, oh, no. I said, no. She goes, no. How do you start that conversation? How indeed? I'm thinking, TED Talk. Which, by the way, raises the question. A comedian talking about depression and suicide? How exactly are you qualified? Now, I'll tell you, I, I believe a comedian is a good choice, and I'll tell you why. Because a comedian's job, if you drill down to it, is to speak truth to power on behalf of the powerless. And in this case, I'm speaking truth to the power of depression on behalf of the powerless, those who are caught in its grip. Number two, I believe that depression is at its core hopelessness. And with humor, there's hope. With laughter, there's life. And that nobody dies laughing. 
And three, I myself suffer from depression. I have thought about killing myself more times than I can count. This is the way the world sees me. And this, with apologies to the Showtime series Dexter, is my dark passenger. This guy has tried to kill me for as long as I can remember. Came very close in 2010. It was the heart of the recession. My corporate speaking business dropped off 80%. My wife and I declared Chapter 7 bankruptcy. We lost everything that we had worked for for 25 years. And I had an itch on the roof of my mouth that I could only scratch with the front sight on my nickel-plated 38. I sent a copy of the speech in MP3 to a buddy of mine in Philadelphia, a guy named Glenn Friesman. And I wanted him to listen to it and tell me what he thought. And the reason I picked Glenn was, anybody here from Philly? Glenn not only grew up in Philadelphia, he grew up on the mean streets of Philadelphia. So he's not sugarcoating anything. He's as subtle as a sledgehammer. Yeah, so I knew he would tell me the truth. So I sent him the MP3 and I waited the phone ring. Yellow. He goes, it's me, Glenn. I go, what do you think? He goes, hey, it's a good talk. He goes, I uh, just got one question. 2010, you got an itch on the roof of your mouth. You can only scratch with the front side on your 38. I go, yeah. He goes, uh, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I said, could you try to sound a little less disappointed? <laughs> you want to know the reason? I said to him three words, my wife, Wendy. I had bought a life insurance policy, a million dollar life insurance policy a while before that. And you may not know this about life insurance, but there's something in every life insurance policy called the suicide clause. If you kill yourself any time in the first two years, first 24 months, pays nothing. After 24 months, a million dollars. So, even though he wanted me dead, <laughs> the rational part of my brain, which by the way was still functioning, was not willing to do that and leave my wife destitute. So I called up my insurance agent a kind and caring and turns out very perceptive man named Graham Benson. I go, hey, Graham, trying to bluff my way through. Hey, you know, life insurance policy I bought, how long ago did I, just out of curiosity, how long ago did I buy that? So he goes to the computer, I can hear him clocking away. He hasn't tumbled to it yet. He comes back on the phone and he goes, uh, it's been 22 months and no, don't do it. Hmm. And I didn't. <clears throat> that day. But I didn't give up on the idea of suicide. I just was not going to do it that day and leave my wife with no resources. And then Glenn says to me, have you told Graham that that phone call with him saved your life? I said, no. But when I get done with my TED talk, I'm going to send him a link and then we're going to start that conversation. That was 2010. That's as close as I've come to dying. Heart disease runs in my family, as does depression and suicide. Uh, it's called generational depression and suicide. That is my grandmother Dixie in the middle there. That's my Uncle Frank on the right, my Aunt Christine on the left. In my grandmother's lap, that's my mother, Little Dixie. It's the eve of the depression. And uh, bless her heart, she got herself and those three kids through the depression. She put them all through college. She saw them all married, and then her job done, she committed suicide. Yep, and uh, my mother found her. My mother was uh, worried, couldn't reach on the phone, drove over to the house. Uh, do you guys remember the milkman? I don't know if they still do the milkman thing in Canada, but the milk was spoiling on the stoop. It was the only thing apparently my grandmother had forgotten, because what she'd done was she'd written all the checks for the bills, addressed the envelopes, and stamped them, put them on the kitchen table, she pinned her will to her sweater. She turned on the gas on the gas stove, and she sat down at the kitchen table, and she wrote this note. My dear children, I am so sorry to leave you, but it can't be helped. All summer long, I have been going downhill. Doctors have done all they could, but in spite of them, my nerves have gone completely shot. I can't sleep, I can't eat, and my mind is sadly unbalanced. Under such conditions, life is absolutely unlivable. Be good 
and meet me in the glory land. Heavenly Father understands. He has forgiven me, and I know you will too. Always my best love, Mother. And this is my great aunt, my grandmother, sister, Foy. Here she is in the lower center at 23. And here she is again. She's second from the right uh, shortly before her death. My mother found my grandmother. My great aunt Foy committed suicide. My mother and I found her. It was a very familiar story. My mother couldn't reach great aunt Foy on the phone. So she bundled me into the car. I was two going on three years old. We drove over to great aunt Foy's apartment, let ourselves in, searched room to room. Last place we looked was the kitchen. Everything was as it should be, except all the food that should have been in the refrigerator was on the counter. The milk, the butter, the egg, the cheese. The refrigerator, an old 1960s lock type, you can only open it from the outside refrigerator. What had happened was my great aunt Foy had decided to commit suicide. She'd crawled into the refrigerator. She'd pulled the door to behind her, clunk, and changed her mind. She tried to claw her way out. So when my mother, me holding onto her skirt tail, opened the refrigerator, my great aunt fell out on top of me. I'm pinned to the floor. Her face is inches from mine, frozen in a final moment of terror. Her hands like claws, fingernails broken, bloodied, and missing. I screamed for days. Pretty much everybody in my family is on some sort of antidepressant, except for me. So pardon the pun, I dodged that bullet. I drink copious amounts of coffee, what I believe to be the mother's milk of motivation. Yeah. And oh man, without the coffee? Yeah, my wife said to me one time, you know, coffee blocks the movement of certain chemicals, uh, minerals through your brain. I said, if I didn't have the coffee, the only mineral moving through my brain would be lead. Yeah, so and, and I believe this is the linchpin, I have a really, really dark sense of humor. The darker, the more therapeutic, for example. I'm on the TED.com website. I type the word suicide in the keyword box. And you know what? Very few TED Talks on suicide compared to other topics. <laughs> and then it hit me. Duh. <laughs> I mean, think about that. If you're really, really good at suicide, Chances are you ain't going to be recording a TED Talk. <laughs> my grandmother killed herself with a gas stove, my great aunt with a refrigerator. What is it with my family and major appliances? <laughs> I drive past Sears, I tear up. When my great aunt fell out on me, you can only imagine the scene and the smell. Well, the smell would have been worse, but the only thing in the refrigerator with my great aunt all that time, box of Arm and Hammer. <laughs> I know, that's just wrong but it's amazingly therapeutic. Yeah, I, uh, your life, don't fake it until you take it. I think that's what happens a lot of times because people can't share. People can't give voice to their feelings, so they just fake it. Until they, I, I believe my grandmother, that was her fate. I believe my great aunt, and I believe Robin Williams. When it came to depression, bipolar, and suicide, same thing. Life is not for everybody. Robin Williams interviewed with Terry Gross on NPR's Fresh Air. Terry Gross asked him point blank, did he suffer from depression, bipolar, and suicidal ideation? And he said, nope. Nope. He denied it till the day he died. I believe he survived as long as he did in the face of his drug and alcohol addiction because he was able to give voice to his feelings and experiences. He talked at length and joked at length about his drug and alcohol use. And I think, I believe his sense of humor bought him all the time that he had. It took him all the way to 62. I believe it really was a matter of laugh or death. When, when, he, when he committed suicide, my, my uh, friends, uh, normal people, 85% uh, of the population doesn't suffer from clinical depression. He was, he was only 62. My friends who are depressed, he made it to 62. Yes! I mean, that's an accomplishment for somebody who suffered the, uh, you know, depression, bipolar, and I'm sure suicidal ideation. See, people don't understand. Let's say my car breaks down. I have three choices. Get a fix, get a new one, or I could just kill myself. <laughs> I know, doesn't that sound absurd? But that thought actually pops into my head. I could get a fix, I could buy a new one, or I could just kill myself. 
That's what, that's what that, that, that generational depression and suicide, that's what having family members check out that way does for your, you know, your brain function. It's always on the menu. And now I believe Robin could get away with his, his, um, you know, his, his monologues about drug and alcohol use because in Hollywood, it's, you know, it's fashionable. You know, drug abuse, treatment, recovery. It's a resume item. It's a best-selling memoir. You guys know who the, the highest paid actor is in Hollywood? Robert Downey Jr., a recovering addict. Yeah. And, and also because drug and alcohol use, drug and alcohol addiction are considered illnesses, universally considered illnesses. But, you know, there was a time when that was not the case. There was a time when drug and alcohol abuse, there, alcoholics were anonymous. Narcotics anonymous. Do you remember? Yeah, there was, a, there was um, you know, it was a moral failing, a character flaw. There was stigma and shame. Much the same way people feel about depression and suicide today. That's the difference. I believe if we'd started this conversation two or three years ago and given Robin Williams permission to give voice to his feelings on those topics, to talk and joke at length, he'd still be alive today. I believe he would have gotten together with Billy Crystal and, and uh, Whoopi Goldberg and said, look, comic relief, let's bring it back. Only this time, instead of raising awareness and money for the homeless, let's raise awareness and money for the hopeless. Let's, you know, let's, uh, but it's too late for Robin. But there are other people. We can still save people. Here's the deal. When uh, the people that suffer from depression have a, an expression about, about the uh, normal people, the 85% of the population that doesn't, the expression is this. You guys see this? Normies just don't get it. That's what people who suffer from depression call normal people, normies. Normies just don't get it. And I must tell you, it's not the normie's fault because it's almost impossible to explain depression. The best I can do with depression is this, is a simile, like you're wearing lead-filled boots. That's what depression is like. It's like walking around in those. Things not to say to somebody who is brave enough to tell you they are depressed. Don't say, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Oh, come on, turn that frown upside down. Yeah, yeah, my personal favorite. You just need a checkup from the neck up. If I hear that again, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> yeah, things to say to someone who's brave enough to say to you they're depressed. I would start with this. Are you depressed or are you depressed, depressed? The depressed, depressed meaning clinical depression. If they are clinically depressed, I would say this. Um, uh, you are not alone. I am here for you. It's not your fault. You're neither crazy, lazy, or seeking attention. I understand that it is not a character flaw or a moral failing. It is an illness. There is treatment available, and I will help you get it and mean it. Second, the last thing is ask them what sort of thoughts they're having. If they're having thoughts of suicide, here's what not to say. Not to say, come on, you got so much to live for. You're just looking for attention. You won't do it. Nobody ever, who talks about it ever does. Oh. Here's what to say if somebody has thoughts of suicide. Don't. Do it. Trust me, it works. Second, do you have a plan, yes or no? And if they have a plan, what is your plan? And the more detailed the plan, the more dangerous the situation. And if somebody tosses that grenade into your lap, that's what that slide is for. There is help available. And the suicide app is actually an iPhone app. Here's what I hope we've done today. We started a conversation, giving permission to people giving permission to people to give voice to their feelings about depression and suicide without recrimination and begun to create a common pool of knowledge in which those who suffer from depression and those who love them can swim.